I'm going to show you five techniques in Photoshop that are specific to real estate photography editing. These often go overlooked, but they can really speed things up and also produce higher quality photos. The first technique, which is super simple to do, you really can't do this in Lightroom Classic, but using the right tools in Photoshop, you can get this ceiling a lot whiter than it normally is. You can see that's what the fix is that was done here, and it would have looked like this. Now let's back up a little bit so that we can see what happened, because originally this was the ambient shot, and we can see it's just a hot mess of all kinds of color casts that are going all over the ceiling. So applying some flash to it, and these are just flash layers, you've probably seen me do this before, and I'm doing a typical two-sided composite, editing myself out, and then I'm also doing some light and blending mode flash pops over here. Once I've got that, I am controlling to a better degree these color casts than what we had if we just had this pure ambient only shot. We try to do HDR from this. So having flash helped, adding some ambient luminance so that we have flambient, we then have some natural light in places that we want, and then a little bit of a window pull right here. Now, if you're not familiar with any of these flash shots, any of the window pulls or the technique here that I'm using on flambient, then you might want to take a look at my course on professional interior real estate photography. I've got a link to that down in the description of this video, as well as other courses I have, for instance, on expert editing, doing exterior photography, videography for real estate, business and marketing for real estate, and I also have links to my books down in the description of this video as well. But moving along here to make this ceiling whiter than what we did was just do this simple correction here. What you normally do is, you can see here that I've got a mask over top of a group that is using a color balance layer and a hue saturation layer. And usually just the hue saturation layer is enough, but the tricky part here is to try to get the ceiling because we've got these lamps that are blocking the ceiling. So let's just shut this off. Let's start from scratch. If we were to be above, for instance, our window pole layer, or for instance, above our ambient luminosity uh, layer that we're using in the flambient blending mode technique, a lot of times we would take Take a polygon tool and we would try to draw a polygon around the ceiling, but when we hit these lamps then we've got somewhat of an issue. So instead, this is what you do. You go over here to the quick selection tools, select object selection tool, but make sure that object finder is turned off. That way you're not going to get your CPU spinning and automatically selecting things. The next thing is to make sure that the mode is in lasso mode. When you have that, then what you can do is draw a lasso very roughly anywhere around this. And you can see I'm just getting very rough and I'm not getting real exact around these lamps. It's going to be able to figure out with AI what I'm really trying to capture. So I'm going to bring that around, let it close. And once again, this is just real sloppy on my part, but look how accurate it got for this selection. So with this then, I could simply apply an action that would take and put, for instance, put the hue saturation layer. You've probably seen me do this before, very common to whiten the ceiling. In the particular example that I did, I then also added a color balance layer and upped it a little bit. But even with the hue saturation layer that was put in here, with just the saturation taken down, using that selection as its mask, I could further desaturate it and also, for instance, lighten that up a little bit. So even with that adjustment, we've got this better looking ceiling. Now, if you'll notice though, not all of the ceiling was captured over here. So we still have some color casts that are going on that were not included. Some of this blue is casting off of this particular wall and up onto the ceiling. So this this is where then the second technique comes in. To identify what you have masked on any type of mask at all, there are three ways to see what you are working on. The first one is to be able to click just Alt or Option if you're on a Mac and then click on the mask. So I'm on Windows, so on the mask over here that we made, I'm going to click on Alt and then just click. So Alt click and now I can see this entire mask. This is much easier to see full screen than just this little icon for this uh, mask over here in the layers panel. So I can see that I am missing a section here and maybe some others. So I can do alt click and it comes back. Another option to see the mask also is to do control click. That puts the marching ants around the mask and sure enough, I can see when I zoom in over here that I am missing this entire area from those marching ants. But I can then do control D or command D if you're on a Mac and make that selection completely go away. 
Another thing too you can do is to do a shift click on the mask and that'll then disable the mask so you can see what it would look like if you were to apply that mask. So that's how you would see the mask, but this leads into then technique number three. And technique number three, which is so often overlooked because it's sometimes hard to find, is how then you add or subtract or make a new selection. So let's back out of here once again and just say that we haven't selected anything yet. I'll go back and use our technique of using, for instance, the object selection tool, and I'll once again just draw something roughly around the ceiling, just like we did before, so we can grab that ceiling so we can apply that desaturation to it. So once it's selected, once again it missed that spot, but we'll do our action that then desaturates everything. That spot's missed, but let's back up here. Before doing that, before applying that, once we have that object selection done, we can add more to it. And that's what these icons are up here. The one all the way on the left, that's when you would make a new selection. The one next to it is to add to a selection, and then the next one is subtract from selection. It gets a little more complicated when we get into intersect with selection. For most real estate photography editing, that's rarely ever used. But let's say here that we wanted to add to this selection. I could then, with the Add Selection checkbox over here selected, I could draw another object, little lasso around there, and it didn't quite capture it. That's okay, because we can also use other tools. For instance, I could use the Polygon Lasso tool, and there, instead of making a new selection, which would get rid of everything we've selected, I can then put Add. And then with the add selection, I could take and say, let's add this area, close it, and sure enough, it just added to it. If it overlapped too much on something, I could subtract it. So if I needed to subtract, for instance, this, I might be able to take, for instance, our object selection tool and draw a lasso just around that area. And then if it was on add, it wouldn't do anything. But if I did the same thing with subtract, and I drew the polygon around that area, sure enough, it subtracted that from the selection. So now when I apply our action to desaturate that ceiling, the whole thing is taken care of. And once again, just like before, I can then tweak this as I needed to. This was just a simple action, and all it did was with the selection, it just created a hue saturation layer, just lowered the saturation, and then I've got the ability to then tweak it as I need to. But there are other ways to also use this to your advantage when it comes to selections. And an easy way to do that too is just by using keyboard shortcuts. Let's take, for instance, the marquee tool. Let's use this as an example. This will apply also to the quick selection tool and also to the polygon tool. But with the marquee tool, let's say that for some reason I wanted to select something here like this door. So I've got the marquee tool selecting this area. Now what I'd like to do is add to it. I could go up here with my mouse and do that, or what I can also do is to add, I can hold down shift, and then I can just drag a new area, and now I've got this and this selected. So I can subtract from the selection then by doing Alt. So if I do Alt or Option, if you're on a Mac, I could hold down Alt, and then put up the uh, marquee tool here, and you can see it took that away. So now I'm able to control what is added, what is subtracted, and what is a new selection just by using keyboard shortcuts. This also goes when we're talking about the object selection tool. So if we were to use object selection, and in this case we'll do a new selection, and we will turn on object finder. Now with object finder, I'll mouse over one of these lamps and it will detect it, and sure enough it did. Now if I had this on new selection and I went over here and I selected this, then it's going to just be selecting that and this one went away. So instead, I can just add it by selecting then the add checkbox up here, hover over this one. Now I have both of those easily selected. So now I could add another adjustment layer. For instance, let's say that I wanted to uh, enrich some of the saturation here. Then I could go to Layer, Adjustment, and then I could go to Hue Saturation Layer, make a new saturation layer, and then just up the saturation a little bit. And if I wanted to darken those up, since that already made that layer and it deselected it, I don't have to select it again. Using that 
second technique that I showed you of getting the mask, in this case we'll do control click on the mask, it selected what we masked and now I've got the selection loaded once again. So now I can go up to layer, new adjustment layer, and let's say we'll use a levels layer. And with the levels layer, now I can darken it. So I can just move this slider in the middle just a little bit to the right, and now I've got this darker image. And once again, that was easy masking, but I was able to control it by adding, by using this little checkbox here. There is also an add and remove when it comes to a very popular tool, and that's the remove tool. Let's zoom in here really close, and let's say that we wanted to remove some of these cups here that are on that uh, windowsill. So if we zoom in here 100%, I'm gonna move over here so we can really see what we're doing, and I'm gonna stamp all these layers so we have just one thing to work with. And to do that, you've probably seen me do this a thousand times, Control, Alt, Shift, E. Now I've got just this one layer that I can work with. And on here then, I wanna use the Remove tool, which is over here, and I'm gonna use the Remove tool to like remove some of these items here. Now you'll notice here there is a plus and a minus icon. So I can, as long as I'm selecting stuff, I can have this go around there, have it select it, and then I can keep going and selecting each individual one. If I went too far on my remove tool, I can then click the minus and go back here and say, you know what, forget about this one, let's remove that from what we're going to do or I could hold down the Alt key. Now, an important thing by doing this is it's just reversing what you had selected. So in this case, since I selected minus, if I hit the Alt key, it's going to then add. You can see also it's changing the icon from minus where it is now to a plus if I press the Alt key. Now, an important thing here with the Remove tool also to make mention of is that if you really want to speed up your editing, don't remove one of these at a time. I'm going to put the plus icon back up here so we can go ahead and grab all these different glasses and let's say we want to remove those. So it's best to pick them all at once and then let it do its remove. If you do these one at a time, then you're going to be waiting and waiting as AI does its thing. So with those all selected, then I can press the checkbox up here and let then Photoshop remove all of them at once. That also speeds things up a lot. Moving on to the next hidden technique, this one is not seen at all, unless you know that it's there. And in this case, for this kitchen, I've got a little fix up here. If I turn this off, you'll notice that there are some real dark shadows down here. If I turn it on and off, you'll see where all those shadows were. There were some dark ones here, over here on the counters. If I turn that off and on, you can see even more, where all of a sudden I was able to lighten those shadows. This wasn't done with shadow sliders or anything similar like that that would be in Adobe Camera Raw. This is a feature that's been there forever in Photoshop, but so often overlooked, and it's using what's known as a gray layer. And that's what's inside this particular group here, this gray layer I called Fixer. Let's make our own and let's start from scratch on this and I'll show you what I mean. What you wanna do is make a new gray layer. And to do that, you would go up to the layer menu, and you would say just new layer. Now we'll call this one gray so we can keep track of it. What you wanna do though is before making it, you wanna change the mode from normal to overlay. When you do that, you're going to get a checkbox that gives you the option to fill with overlay neutral color 50% gray. When you click that and then you click okay, you've got this entire gray layer. Now, didn't change anything, as you can see here, because it's in overlay mode. If this was in normal mode, this is what it would look like. But let's put that back into then overlay mode. What we can do then, we'll zoom in here on, for instance, this problem area down here on the floor that's got these kind of weird, dirty looking shadows on it. What I can do is I can really lighten those up by doing a dodge and burn on the gray layer, and then it's not going to be affecting anything else. So what you do is you go over to a tool that is rarely ever used anymore, and over in this section you've got Dodge and Burn. Burn will darken, Dodge will lighten. Let's select the Dodge tool, and then up here, make sure that you have Midtones selected because you can just work on shadows and highlights. We'll do the Midtones, and then also a very low exposure, usually about five to 10% really helps because at this point what you're gonna do is you're going to paint in some of these areas. And that's with this Dodge tool. So just like any other brush tool, you can change the size of it, and then you slowly just 
paint over these areas. And you can see as I'm painting over those areas, it's becoming lighter. And if I turn the gray layer off, you can see the difference. Let's zoom all the way out and we can get a better idea. So I can even just lighten up a little bit of this. Down here, once again, there's a lot of shadows. So I can take that tool down just a little bit, and just maybe lightly brush around some of those areas, really brighten up this cabinet over here, or excuse me, the backsplash below the cabinet. Once again, I can just dodge some of this over here. And it's making small minute changes as I'm doing this. And all you have to do to see the difference is then turn that layer off or turn it back on. So this really helps in these areas where you just need to add a little bit of emphasis. Now the opposite to this is known as burn. And what you would do is you would select the burn tool. And when you do that, that would darken areas. So typically I don't use burn when it comes to real estate photography, but just to give you an example, if I were to, for instance, lower some of these highlights up here, I could burn those just ever so slightly. Once again, it's all done on the gray layer. Now, if I turn that layer off, you can see that sure enough, that was brighter than before then I burned it. But it's something rarely ever done. Usually most of the time I need to lighten things. So most of the time you're going to be using Dodge. Since this is also a separate layer, you could add a layer mask to it. For instance, I could go up to layer and then down to layer mask and reveal all. If I didn't like what I did here, I could erase just part of it. I'll use the eraser tool with just a low flow. And with that flow then, I can just erase a little bit of it up here. Now I've got control over how much I burn without having to go back and dodge and burn. Now I've got much more control over this layer. Moving on to the next technique here that is hidden. Once again, this is rarely ever found. And that's that if you want to remove objects, you do it with a blank layer. Let me show you. Out here, this was for a designer and the place was still under construction. So there's a lot of stuff that's out here that needs to be removed. And once again, these are edits that are paid by the hour. When you're shooting for designers, remodel companies, anything architectural wise, this is another phase of the project where after they reviewed the initial photos, they come back with edits and then you charge by the hour to do this type of stuff. So we want to remove this and you could stamp all the layers together. You could remove it and all that but it is much easier to do this non-destructively on a blank layer. So this is what you do. You simply make a new layer that doesn't have anything on it. You go to layer, new, layer, and I'll call this removes, just like that. Now we've got this blank layer up at the top. And if I select something like the remove tool, and most importantly here, I have sample all layers checked. And in this case too, I just want to use standard remove. So I have generative AI off, you know, from other videos I've done, I really don't like using generative AI on. If I'm going to use generative AI, I'm going to use then the generative fill, which gives me more than one option. Anyways, back to the point here, I've got the remove tool selected. We are on plus so that we can remove a lot of stuff. And then what I can do is let's remove, for instance, this here. I'll remove that little bit of yellow uh, tape there. It probably was. I'll go around, grab this table, those bricks. Once I've got that selected, then I can just press the checkbox. And of course, it's going to do its remove. Boom. It's all gone. But it did it non-destructively because that's only on the remove layer. So if I turn the remove layer off, you can see there it is. Everything else was maintained below it. It was only these objects that were removed right here. This is what the, the work that the remove tool did by adding in its own little AI here. And then let's say that you liked this, but you weren't sure about how you were going to deal with that. Make a new blank layer. So once again, go up to layer and then new layer, and we'll call this remove two. So we've got another remove layer that we can then use our remove tool on and keep that separate. So we can have a bunch of different blank layers to deal with as we need to. Once that's selected, for instance, in this case, and I hit the checkbox up here or enter on your keyboard, then it goes away. Now, I didn't really like the remove here because it grabbed too much. It added some of the window. So I would probably edit this differently. But the key here is that I'm able to do that because I don't have to worry about my other remove layer, which was here. 
I only have to deal with this particular layer here. And there are so many other hidden techniques in Photoshop that just are so often overlooked. There's been so much concentration on all the new stuff in Lightroom Classic and all the AI stuff that Adobe puts out, but there's a lot of stuff here that's covered, not just in this particular video, but other ones that I have on my channel. I'll have links to those also down in the description of this video.